So Luke puts two stories back to back that can seem to kind of contradict each other. Last week we had the lawyer who has no problem loving God, but feels a twinge of um, self-justification that he needs to do when he's asked to love his neighbor. And this week, we seem to have almost the opposite. There is Martha who is loving her neighbor. She's being a good host or hostess. She's cooking, she's getting things ready, she's making sure that Jesus and his followers, who were usually around at the same time, are all being taken care of. Uh, she's doing all this stuff, and as Jesus points out, she's distracted by a lot of things. She's got a lot of stuff going on, because she's trying to love her neighbor as she would love herself. And yet, Jesus teaches Martha that, seems to teach Martha that doing good for others, like cooking for them and that kind of thing, is not quite as good as loving God. So, what gives? What gives in these two stories? And, and they're right back to back from each other. What is really cooking in this passage? It's okay, you can laugh. What is the best part that Jesus says Mary is choosing? What is he getting at? And, and, and how do we develop the wisdom to choose that better part? And the key really lies in what's going on in the background, on the, the other side of the page that we might not see, in the context of, of that world and that culture. Now, in the context that, that this story occurs, the episode would, would have been shocking, not just not for Jesus reproving Martha, but for him praising Mary. As far as Jesus' own culture was concerned, Martha was in the right. She knew how to serve itinerant rabbis and their company that would, that would come to, the, to her house. She knew how to treat guests with honor and hospitality. She knew that her place was back in the kitchen. And the apostles probably expected Jesus to rebuke Mary because she was the one breaking the rules. It would have been scandalous. For a woman to sit at Jesus' feet, just like a disciple would. It would have been crazy. Martha would have had every right in their minds to be angry that Mary was doing what she was doing. You see, it was the custom of, Jewish, uh, of a Jewish man to pray every morning. To thank God that he was not born a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. A common saying of the time was that it was better for the Torah, that, that is the, the five holiest books of the Jewish Old Testament, the Torah. It was better for the Torah to be burned than to put in the hands of a woman. So for Mary to sit at Jesus' feet, just as any student of a great rabbi would, just as any other disciple was at that moment probably. For Mary to do that was scandalous. For Jesus to commend her, though, was just as scandalous. And for Jesus to speak to Martha in the way that he did, though, was less correction, but it was more invitation. Martha was encouraged to dare, leaving, to, dare to leave all that behind and to feast on the same fellowship that Mary enjoyed with Jesus. Jesus commends Mary's daring to exercise the freedom that Jesus brings. He commends Mary's spirit of, of, of daring to do whatever she had to do to follow Christ, even if it meant being a little unconventional. Breaking with those customs those powerful prejudices, and just sitting right there and basking in Jesus' presence, listening to what he was teaching. Jesus views with great honor and approval. In fact, the one thing needful is desiring Christ above all else, above all security, above all popularity, and all the other conventions that may stop us from really going all the way with our faith. But we're offered that same freedom when Christ invites us to his table. Do we really dare taste and see that the Lord is good? 
The early Christians believed in a big Jesus. One that you could not put inside of a box or inside of the, the cage of modern conventions or conventions of their day. Jesus was the one who tore down the walls that we humans build in between each other. And, and this beautiful and, and almost extravagant picture is what Paul is trying to paint in his letter to the Colossians. If, if you probably were thinking during reading that passage, wow, this is kind of thick, you weren't wrong. Paul is trying to, to use his language the best he can, and he was a great user of language. He's trying to take the undescribable, the, the, the indescribable holiness and goodness and power and love of God and boil it down to something that he can write with pen on paper that can be read at a church in Colossae. That's hard to do. So he does kind of go on and on and on about how amazing and how wonderful this is. And then he talks about how Christ was, Christ was God reconciling us to himself. This big gap that had opened up between our sin and God's holiness is now no longer there because of what Christ has done. And the Good News translation puts it that we are no longer enemies of God, but through Christ we have become friends of God. We can sit there at God's feet. We don't have to stay in the kitchen away from the Torah and away from um, everybody else. We can sit there at Jesus' feet. That's the amazing thing that grace has done. He's trying to get those Colossians to see just how amazing this work of God in Jesus Christ has been. And so in our search to know what God is like, to really just look at Jesus, to consult what he did, his grace for sinners, his, his joy in the presence of children, his healing compassion for those who hurt, and his love for the lonely, the left out, the chastised, or the left behind. And we can also look at his impatience towards the pharisaical sorts who were inflexible and intolerant. We believe that their way was the highway, and all else needed to be left behind. We can look at his tendency to offer fresh starts and second chances, to offer a home to people who had none. And in all these and other countless ways, we're given a glimpse into the very heart of God. We're told in, in, in Paul's verses that Jesus is the very image of of the invisible God. If you want to know what God looks like, if you want to know what God does, what God says, how God would act, look at Jesus. That's also part of why the Bible calls Jesus the Word of God incarnate. He is that very Word, that very life essence of God come to earth. So if you want to know, look at the Gospel. Look at how Jesus acted, what he did, how he treated others, and you'll find your answers. Paul tells us he's the image of the invisible God in verse 15, the firstborn of all creation, that he has always been there and always will be. In verse 19, we're told, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And the one thing needful is desiring that that Christ above all else, above all security, above all popularity, and above all the conventions that can hold us back. It's surrendering yourself to the earth-shattering and earth-creating bigness of God's love that reconciles you to God and makes you a friend of God, despite all the imperfections and sin that you and I still have. Do we dare taste and see that the Lord is good? Do we dare sit at his feet, even though it's not the right, not the polite thing to do? Do we respond? How do we respond to Jesus' invitation to break all the norms and the things that hold us back and simply sit at Christ's feet and follow him? 
do we dare choose 